Hello, everyone. Welcome to Scrounge Up. Intelligence and the ability to take effective decisions to project future has fascinated individuals and entities across nations, its government, industries, organizations, and academia, in short, referred to as NGIOA, since its early existence. This is mainly because forecasting errors or taking bad decisions is much more than loss of money. As a result, irrespective of humans or computers across NGIOA, making accurate projections based on sound intelligence process and decision support system is fundamental for the survival and sustainability of humanity. Computational intelligence is about building intelligence agents. The ability of a computer to learn a specific task from all available data and take the right decision is changing not only the fundamentals of computational intelligence, but also how we address complex real world problems to which mathematical or traditional modeling is not generally very effective. Computational intelligence shows tremendous promise. To discuss computational intelligence further, I'm honored to welcome David Fogel to Risk Roundup. David is the president of Natural Selection, and he's also the co-chair of 2017 IE Symposium series on computational intelligence. Welcome, David. We are honored to have you on Risk Roundup. Thank you, Tayshree. It's a pleasure. Wonderful, David. So it is believed by many that the current technological momentum, which covers many disruptive technologies, such as art, artificial intelligence, of course, but Internet of Things, big data, cloud computing, deep learning, is not only the beginning of a new industrial revolution, but that the developments in artificial intelligence, here we are using the term broadly artificial intelligence, will be driving the transformation process across NGIO, that means nations, its government industries, organizations, and academia, in not only cyberspace or geospace, but also in space, in short referred to as CG, as cyberspace, geospace, and space. So is AI, that is artificial intelligence, the driver of this new industrial revolution that is expected to fundamentally transform NGIOA in CGS? So great, great, great question. So here's the thing. The question I have for that, back to you, is, is AI a tool or is it its own thing? And to me, it's always been a tool. So I have a hesitancy to say that it's going to be some new thing of itself because it's, it's really sort of a Swiss Army knife of things that we can use to solve problems. And the Swiss Army knife gets better and better and better over time as we get faster computers and better ideas about how to match algorithms to the problems that we want to solve. So I hesitate to go as far as you were maybe not purposely leading me there, but you know it's an open-ended question. So I, I think it's, um, there's a revolution at hand, but it's not particularly that AI is the revolution, it's AI is facilitating the revolution, in my mind. Yes, yes, absolutely. Now, when it comes to artificial intelligence, again, we are speaking broadly, it involves all the you know, intelligence uh, uh, trends that are going uh, forward these days. What are the broad trends you see with respect to computing technologies, especially? So I think you know, computing technology in terms of hardware has grown up to the point where it's supporting deep learning applications now. And that's why everybody is uh, focusing on that, and rightly so. I remember when I started working on evolutionary algorithms back in the 19, 1984, 1985, something like that. We had uh, a Commodore 64, for those of us who might remember what a Commodore 64 is all about. Uh, an Apple II, something like that. So, you know, the kind of things that we could do were much less than the kind of things that you could do on a watch today, right? Something like that. So, as hardware grows up, the ideas that we can try to leverage also grow up with it. And now we can do things that have thousands of hidden layers uh, in a neural net that's doing a facial recognition pattern on a pixel level. And that really couldn't be done practically 10 years ago, 20, certainly 20, 30 years ago. Yeah. But, you know, I, again, it, for, for when I started working, for example, with my father, who was one of the pioneers of artificial intelligence, uh, Larry Fogel, who worked on evolutionary programming, um, you know, his computer back in the 60s was punch cards and paper tape and things like that. When I started working with him, we had just got to the point where desktop machines were able to solve some interesting problems in industry. So you didn't have to have a mainframe like an IBM 704 machine in order to solve some real problems. Now, when you have GPUs and things like that that are available, it makes those sorts of problem solving um, much more cost effective, right? 
So I think that there's always going to be a marriage between what the algorithms are and what the hardware is that supports it. Uh, over the development of computational intelligence, you know, we found different ideas of simulating evolution or thinking about how people describe things, let's say, descriptively in linguistic terms, which is all about fuzzy logic. And we can talk a little bit about that, too, how, how we describe things very imprecisely, but a lot more effectively than if we had to describe them precisely. And I think over time, as people find different benefits to those approaches, they'll design specific hardware that supports those approaches. It just so happens that there's a very nice fortuitous uh, time and time that we're at now between where GPUs are and where neural nets are, where we can support deep learning applications with those yes. sorts of designs and also specific designs that go beyond GPUs. Yes, very true, very true. Now, the concept of intelligence has often been presented in philosophical, psychological, or physiological terms based on the involved human brain anatomical structures and also taking into account the mechanisms of learning and memory. Now, mm -hmm. with respect to intelligent activity or intelligence, how can we implement that in computers? So my view of intelligence follows, again, what my, my father gave me as a view. I think it's the right view, but other people might have a different view. But my view of intelligence is it's a property of a system that allows it to adapt its behavior to meet desired goals. And so we can look at many different systems as being potentially intelligent, humans being one, but other animals being another. You could think about a colony of ants being intelligent, for example, right? Maybe each individual ant might not be. I, won't, I don't want to say because I'm not an entomologist, so I don't know for sure. But if we think about, let's say each ant is an automaton. It's doing its thing. It's just a stimulus response machine that has no adaptivity. But collectively as a group, that ant colony can learn where food is, where it isn't, defend itself, attack other invading uh, creatures. So there's a, a great deal of what we might call adaptability uh, and be able to adapt behavior to meet goals across a range of environments. Yes, if we think about it, you know, if we think about it more broadly like that, then it's not so much just about pattern recognition, which we find in, in deep learning or other neural net examples, and it's not so much even pattern discovery, but it's how you put all those things together in a system to say, I have a purposeful system. What's the purpose? So the first thing we have to think about is, are we describing the purpose of the system mathematically, if we're going to design one? Right? If we're just looking at someone else, we don't have to impute a mathematical reason for them. But it helps when we're making an algorithm to say, well, what is it that we want this thing to actually do? And then from there, we can say, well, what techniques do we need in order to have it uh, adapt its behavior to meet those goals? So it could be that we would be using, let's say, like a fuzzy logic controller. Now, that's been around for quite some time, probably 25 years since I saw my first fuzzy logic controller. But there are improvements that are made, of course, as um, algorithms go on. But the idea there is that in order to control a system, instead of saying that the system is in a particular state or not in a particular state, you would say something like, well, it's in this state with some degree of membership, but it's also in this other state with some degree of membership because we don't want to say that if it moved, like, let's say, one inch to the side over here, it would be in this state, but one inch to the other side, it would be in a different state. Or maybe in, maybe if it's not distance, it might be some other property like temperature or pressure or humidity, something like that. So because we talk all the time in generalities of broad descriptions like that, we can actually find that we can make intelligent systems that react on those uh, descriptions just as well. If we're driving in a car and you're driving and I'm in the right seat and I say push hard when you, on the brakes when we get close to the intersection, you know exactly what I mean. But I gave you a very imprecise description, right? If I said, well, I'm going to pick a number. Push with uh, 27.234 newtons of force when we get 37.6 meters from the intersection, you might, you might look at me and go, what are you talking about? Right. So the, the precision that we uh, assume in computers oftentimes can be disadvantageous, and we can help to make more intelligent systems that react better with people, I think, in the future, particularly by having that interaction between the computer and the person be more of what the person expects. Right now, there's a lot of focus on what the, what the technologies can do in terms of, well, it can solve this problem. I think what's still missing is how does that uh, solution then come back to a person who's actually going to use that system. I, I offer one case. I'm an advisor on a company here in town called Trials.ai, and they're working on making AI tools for clinical research and making protocols, things like that, so that those things can be done more effectively and more efficiently. And as we've talked about, it's okay to data mine out information from patient data if it's available and from clinical trial data that's available and find interesting patterns and uh, even innovative uh, things that people haven't seen before. 
But ultimately, that information has to be presented to a physician or someone doing the clinical research in a way that's interpretable to them and can be useful to them. Otherwise, you can have the best information available, but it might not be actually used by anybody. So that's some of the things we try to focus on in practical engineering problems when we're talking about how to design an intelligent system. We also have to make sure that it's actually a usable system. And I, I think I've taken your question and probably gone in three different directions. But No, that, that's perfect. That's perfect. Yeah. It was very useful information, everything that you said. So okay. based on you, uh, your understanding and what you have observed in mm -hmm. the field, what is the state of computer intelligence today? How would you describe it? Gosh, I think we're just getting started. It feels like we've been going for a long time, but I, you know, maybe I guess we have been going for a long time, almost 70 years since maybe uh, we'd say Alan Turing's paper in, in mind from 1950. I guess that might be a good time to start. But do you can say McCulloch and Pitts were working on neural nets uh, even earlier than those sorts. It, it's a broad field, right? So it goes back a long way. But let's call it 70 years. So I think in 70 years we've come a long way, but I, I feel like we're we're just getting uh, started because again, so much of of what we think we can do is limited by the interactions of the things that it can't do. So let me offer a, um, an observation on that. I think a lot of times, for example, when I was a grad student, we would work on things in robotic systems, but we didn't really have robotic systems handy, so we made simulations of them, which were pretty good simulations, and we would have a, a neural net to decide where the robot should go or what it was, maybe it would try to pick up something, or maybe it was simulating robot soccer between different soccer agents and how to find the ball and kick the ball between the, the things, but all in simulation, right? And so you think, well, what does it take to actually put that in real robots and then have them play soccer? Well, people do that now, right? I mean, those are, there are annual competitions on that and it's getting better. But then you think about, okay, what does it take to actually think about making commander data? to pick a good, a good robot, right, as opposed to a Terminator. So what, what would it take to have something that you could actually interact with, it's autonomous, well, it's got energy issues, it's gotta interact with you in a way that you understand and like. It gets back a little bit to that fuzzy logic thing. One of my, one of my colleagues, uh, Jim Keller from Missouri, uh, made the point, you know, if you think about R2-D2 and C-3PO, which one's smarter? Well, most people would say R2-D2, right? But they probably like 3PO better, and part of that is because 3PO talks to you, and he's actually got kind of a sense of humor sometimes, right? Whereas, you know, R2-D2 is a bunch of whistles. So again, it gets back to how can we take these problems that we're working on now, we can recognize the face, we can recognize um, all sorts of different patterns, whether it's signals um, that we might be listening to on a telephone, it might be things that we're observing in space, it might be all sorts of different things, as you said, with the internet of things, it could be anything. but as we think about how do we take that into autonomous agents that are going to interact with us and be our friends going forward, right, and and actually help us to do things, I think we're we're still really just getting started with that because there's a long way from a Roomba to commander data. Yes, we are just getting started. You're absolutely right. Now, if you're looking for a way of intelligence or a way of reasoning that is close mm -hmm. to the humans, Mm -hmm. How we, you know, reason how, how uh, where our intelligence, you know, comes from, or how is it based? Which approach of computer, uh, computational intelligence you think is the best? Wow. Okay. So to to go with the premise of your question, uh, I would have to go to neural dynamics. So people who are working on actually trying to understand what the mechanisms of the brain are, and I've seen some very interesting presentations over the years by people who are studying different parts of the brain, for example, the auditory system that Lloyd Watts was uh, presenting on at a couple of conferences that I've chaired and attended. Um, but I think, you know, trying to put all that together to try to make a human brain by understanding how the human brain works is, is a very, very difficult challenge, not one that shouldn't be taken up, of course, particularly by those who care to. But uh, I think, again, focusing at lower levels in the evolutionary chain at the same time and trying to understand what the brain function is of things that are not at the end point, let's call humans the end point. Um, but, you know, the, again, that whole system of thinking about a brain, let's come back to the evolutionary part about just making something like a fly, okay, a housefly. If you really wanted to make an autonomous housefly, a robot housefly that could do everything a fly can do, you have a lot of challenge just there, right? Because it's it's small, it's got to be powered, it's got to make more flies. That's a challenge. It's got to make more flies. It's got to be able to avoid a fly swatter, and it's got to find energy sources as it flies around, right? So 
all those that's complicated already right and you think well you know that's just a fly so when you think about making something that's like a human brain it gets back to okay well what robot does it sit in and what what are the what are the mechanisms of interaction for that robot with the rest of the world is it going to have our own sort of vision does it get ir sensors does it get to see uv does it get to see x-rays does it get to feel temperature does it get taste what does it get and and i i think it's premature to say well we're going to just go follow this path because it's the human path, right? But again, I, I think, I don't want to say, um, I don't want to discourage anybody doing research in any part of AI, but I do I do want to encourage broad thinking. So I get back to, for example, simulating evolution. Evolution is a very broad mechanism of machine learning. You can apply it to almost anything. Um, different subsets of it come up in reinforcement learning and other forms that may be more tailored to a particular problem. And so if you know something about your problem, you might want to design something with some other algorithm. But I think, you know, in general, when we don't know too much about a problem, thinking about a broad adaptive learning scheme like we find in nature with evolution can be a good idea, too. Yes, yes. Now, I mean, uh, the paradigms of co computational intelligence are, I, I believe, inspired from biology and nature yeah. and understanding the evolutionary computing and all that is uh, so very essential. But from your perspective, across nations, it's government industries, organizations and academia, where does the field of computational intelligence are making effective contributions at this point? Oh, well, across all areas. <laughs> so, uh, you know, we can pick we can pick one. So I've, I've had the opportunity in my career to work on things in drug design and in, in food risk screening for products coming into the United States of America, breast cancer detection, other medical devices to help people uh, alleviate their tinnitus, all these things with computational intelligence methods, helping sports teams predict the right uh, players to have on their team, whether it's baseball or football, uh, ticket price optimization. You can, you can name uh, probably another 10 that I've worked on with, uh, with good success across a wide variety of things. So when we have an IEEE conference, for example, you mentioned the symposium series on computational intelligence that I'm co-chairing uh, later this year in November with Piero Bonasoni, who's also here in San Diego, but we're, we're holding it in Honolulu um, at the Hilton Hawaiian Village. There's going to be about 34 different symposia on different topics of computational intelligence. And some of them are going to be on cybersecurity, which is obviously one of particular interest to you and many others. And a, and a very tough challenge where I think computational intelligence methods can be of help in, in finding things that are zero day attacks and trying to do pattern discovery as opposed to pattern recognition. But many other things too, in terms of avionics, industry, electronic learning, how do we disseminate information to people to help them learn faster? Uh, healthcare, how could we maybe, I know other colleagues of mine are working on avatars that can interact with people and help um, have a personal interaction with them that might be missing when a nurse is only available to come by, let's say six times in a day, what does the patient do in the other part of the day when they are by themselves? It would be nice if they could talk to some thing that would interact with them and actually demonstrate a level of understanding with them. Uh, my friend Nori Daroga is working on that. So there's many different uh, aspects of it. And I think that trying to combine how we interact with people personally across these different industries, whether it's uh, risk-based things like we've talked about here, or whether it's improving pr production, or whether it's proving how businesses find other businesses. Another company I uh, advise is called Lead Crunch, and that's their business, business to business lead finding using artificial intelligence. They're also here in San Diego. Um, there's just a, such a wide variety of problem space to be able to say we're helping with things. Um, everything from JPL to uh, stuff we might find in the house. So I, I don't want to pick any one because I'm going to be, I'm going to get phone calls from my other friends like, what about me? So I think, you know, we can focus on any one if you like, but I, I mean, I've had the opportunity to work on industry, finance, medicine, defense, homeland security, video game things, all these different things with uh, different AI methods. I wanted to come back to something that you, you mentioned about computational intelligence being inspired uh, from biology. And it's, it's fun for me, having been there kind of at the beginning of all of that, to see where we are now. Because I remember in 1985 or so, there was something of a scientific confrontation, let's say, between traditional AI people who were rule-based systems people and machine learning people. And this was before DARPA started refunding neural networks in about 1987, 1988, when Barbara Yoon was the director there at DARPA and started refunding things. So 
the, the rule-based people had been around for a long time. Neural Nets had a little thing in the 60s, right? And then Minsky and Papert's book on perceptrons came out and put a damper on the whole field of machine learning generally, really, I'd have to say. Um, then there's kind of this little conflict between rule-based and neural nets and rule-based and evolutionary things. And, and then fuzzy systems, there's a lot of confusion. Like fuzzy systems is just another name for probability, and it's, it's really not. So it took a long time for neural nets and fuzzy systems and evolutionary algorithms and then swarm intelligence to get together and be its own thing that's like, okay, we can look to nature for inspiration beyond just what do we find in the rules that human beings use to solve a problem. By 1993 or so, I guess, you know, 1993 or so, there was a neural networks council within the IEEE. And this was a big deal because we had many different societies, computer society, power engineering society, all sorts of different ones coming together saying, you know, maybe these other techniques that are not rule-based can actually be of, of help. That it took another 10 years for us to form the neural network society and then the computational intelligence society with the, with the main journals that we have in evolution and computation and fuzzy systems and neural nets. But today, when we hear a story about artificial intelligence, I'd say eight out of 10 times, it's a story about deep learning. Right. And the other two out of 10 times, it's, it might be even some other biologically inspired thing. There's not so much stuff that's done with rule based things anymore. And I find that that a nice um, convergence of things. But I have to say, I don't you know, for a while I was a little dismissive of rule based things. But there's a big and important place for rule based systems, particularly when you have a very well understood system and you need to make it clear to a person who's going to use that system. So let's uh, take an example. Let's say we're we're screening uh, cyber attacks for risk, right? For cyber traffic for risk, and something gets flagged. As an analyst, you might want to know, well, why did it get flagged? What, 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 what was it, right? What was the pattern that you discovered? And if it's hard for the system to tell you what the pattern is, then you say, okay, well, let's go find out. And if, if it's right a lot of the time, then you start to trust it anyway. But if it's wrong, and if it's wrong at, at certain important times, then it becomes something like a like one of those magic eight balls that you shake up and you turn over and it says, "Ask me again later," or "Most definitely," or "Certainly not." But what you just like, I don't know what it's doing, right? If on the other hand you can have it say, "I did this because this rule fired, this rule fired, and this rule fired," you understand that it can say, "Yes, I understand that," right? That gives you maybe more confidence about it. So there's a trade-off between simplicity and complexity there, where Complexity can help you find things that you might not understand or have thought to look for, but you have to be able to still relate them. And then if you're responsible for taking an action based upon what that system is doing, it's very important that you be able to say with authority, okay, I took the action because X, Y, Z, because other people are going to ask you, why did you do that? And especially if you did it wrong, there might be some legal consequence. Some lawyer is going to ask you, why did you do that? And the answer can't be because the magic box told me to, right? Nobody, nobody's going to like that answer. Yeah. So there's there's a there's a place for rule based systems. There's a place for linear regression. Right. There's a place for all the standard tools of statistics that go along with all the things that we find to be a little bit more, let's say, magical, like evolutionary algorithms and deep learning nets and and things like that. Sure. So it, it's important to not um, lose sight of how they all fit together when you're solving a problem. In fact, I say you know for all the problem solving that I've done in, in 30 plus years of engineering. I can't think of a single system where I've designed something that was just one uh, method of solving the problem. It's always been a hybrid approach if I wanted to really get the, the most out of it. Like I might do an evolutionary search for parameters of a neural net, and then I would use some gradient technique to make sure that I got to the, the most defined local minimum. Because the evolutionary search might not be so good at finding a very uh, specific local minimum, but it uh, might be good at keeping me out of ones that are uh, presenting performance that's too poor. So again, trying to think about instead of I've got the method, let's find the problem. It's, it's the problem and what methods collectively go into having a solution for that problem. Sure, no, that that's a very good explanation. Now you described, you know, a lot of applications that are currently yeah. very active based on this. And uh, where do you think is that intelligent process for all those applications coming from? What kind of algorithm is driving that? Well, could you could you focus me maybe a little bit more on a particular industry, or I could pick one if you like. You broadly, I mean, you, you can pick one industry, but broadly speaking, because I have been you know reading a lot of reports that some says it's the quantum algorithms that are you know driving all these uh, uh, intelligence advances. 
But what is your understanding of this? Well, my understanding of that, and I, I have to defer to people who are working more specifically in the field, is we're not quite there yet with, with quantum algorithms driving everything. Um, to me, the algorithms that are driving most of the successes that, that I see are based upon stochastic gradient descent for deep learning applications, for example, or in the other ones that don't get a lot of mention in the press lately, but I, I still know about them because I work on them, uh, other advances in evolutionary algorithms on different data structures. So it might be with a neural net structure, or it might be something that's a hybrid of a neural net and a decision tree, or something like that, for example, so that we can uh, abstract out what those rules are for someone and have the decision tree map the neural net's behavior as best as possible by evolving that decision tree to map the net, sort of like data mining the net. And you can only do, um, you can only approximate it, of course, but maybe you can come up with a pretty good approximation. So to me, I think actually it's more still the core algorithms of computational intelligence. Um, which are the algorithms of neural learning and the algorithms of evolutionary, evolutionary learning, which I would include uh, swarm intelligence in that too, but we can talk about what the differences are. And then also uh, fuzzy systems where you're describing things with membership functions and you say something is in a set with a particular membership, which is between zero and one, and then you do mathematics on those membership functions and the members, degrees of membership to figure out what you want to do about a particular state that the fuzzy system is in. I think the thing that's been missing in all of that is something else I've been working on, which I'd like to promote a little bit more to my academic colleagues, particularly I have to find a way to do this, which is understanding uh, sentiment, which is emotion, right? So we talk about, for example, fuzzy systems and describing, let's say, a stock price. Okay, so we, we pick a stock. I'll pick one at random, Apple. So Apple trades at whatever it is. Let's say it's $150 a share, and someone says, that's high, okay? Someone else might say, no, it's going to 200, so that's low. Okay, we, they have different of opinion, different opinions. But let's say it's $150 and one penny. Did the person who thinks it's low would say it's no longer low? Probably not, right? So that's where we get a degree of membership in something. We can think about those same sort of things with words that we use, right? When we're talking about uh, how we describe something, there's many different ways that the English language or other languages can be used to describe the same concept. I could say, um, if you tell me a funny joke, I could say, Jay Shree, that's a funny joke, or that's a really funny joke, or I could say, that joke just kills me. Now, different parts of the brain are hearing that in a different way, right? The limbic system is hearing that different than the prefrontal cortex is processing it. So the actions that we take based upon the words that we hear or read, see, imagery, things like that, can actually have an effect. It can be a subconscious effect or it can be a conscious effect later on um, in our behavior. And I'd like to see us try to get that sort of sentiment analysis uh, put in with computational intelligence for human interacting systems. Because really, again, w once we get past the problem of can we recognize these data and identify them, whether it's a face or music, because we, we you know, did our little Shazam thing and we say, hey, what's this tune? And it tells us the tune. Or we, we help other people. Another project I'm working on is in um, helping people who are colorblind and identify what clothes they need to wear based upon the colors. But once we get past those sort of pattern recognition issues, the real issue is going to be how does that system intelligently interact with you? And how does it make you feel? Because a lot of the decisions that we make are not based upon logic, right? Those are the decisions that computers make. The decisions that we make are often based upon how do we feel? And I, 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 I can give you a great example of that. So my dad had invented a um, multivariate um, objective function system called what he called evaluated state space. And uh, I, I'll take a minute and go back on what my dad's contributions were in a, in a minute here. But so he has a, he had a rigorous way of scoring what are the parameters of concern for a particular problem? What are the degrees of achievement that you can have on those parameters? How do you want to aggregate those parameters? Do you want to add them up and weight, weight them and add them up and divide like an arithmetic sum? Or is it more appropriate to take a geometric mean? Because maybe if one of them goes to zero, they all go to zero, right? That could be a case. So when I had a choice to go to graduate school at UCSD or University of Hawaii in Honolulu in 1987, we did this. We made the purpose of what going to college is all about and what are we going to gain from going to each college. And I wrote down all the parameters for each one and all the degrees of achievement for each one, and it gets rated on a 0 to 100 scale. And as I recall, the UCSD choice came out to be 1% higher than the University of Hawaii choice. And then I looked at my dad and said, but I want to go to Hawaii. And that, that was the, that's the missing ingredient, right? Where was the emotion about 
what was going on in how you're scoring things. So I went to University of Hawaii, by the way, for a, a semester, and then I decided to come back and, and actually do my master's and PhD at UCSD after all. But I can tell you in the moment, you know, that was the, the thing that was missing. And I think that's still a lot of what's missing in what we think about how intelligence systems are going to interact with people in the future. So the sentiment analysis, I've worked on a system called Effect Check. Um, the tagline is what effect are your words having? So you can find that at effectcheck.com. And it's a software as a service. And people can load up a document and score it. And we're using that in many different industries now to help people with their communications, press releases, uh, media handling, even attorneys might want to use it. But I think, you know, once we go on beyond how people are using it, we want to try to marry that up with how artificial intelligence algorithms might use it in order to convey whether they should say that joke just kills me or they should say that's a really funny joke. Because <laughs> no, it makes I mean, a difference. <laughs> you gave a really good example of how you, you know, took that decision for your college. Now, we are facing yeah. so many complex real world problems right now. And it seems that traditional modeling is useless here, you know, to solve all those complex real world problems. So how would you go for, you know, applying that computational intelligence to create value or to solve all these, you know, uh, complex problems that we are facing currently. Would you go with the same pro approach that you used in college or there is something more that you would like to add there? Well, I, I guess, you know, it, to the extent that we can quantify emotion, I'd like to, I'd like to try because uh, ultimately it would be nice if every decision were rational. I, you know, it's, it's really a, a real question about, from a, it'd be nice to have one of my psychology um, colleagues answer the question of what would the human brain be without emotion, right? If it's it's uh, it's not clear to me what the answer would really be. So it's a uh, it's a useful evolutionary invention, right? Um, but I, I'll answer your question a little differently, then you can redirect me if you want to. But I, you know, for me, I always try to start with understanding the problem as opposed to understanding the technique. And it's it's all. I mean, I see a lot of uh, companies pitching with new problem spaces, but a lot of the same techniques. And I wonder sometimes whether there's been enough thought about what the problem space is before thinking about what the technique is. Maybe the technique is getting a lot of attention from a venture capital group or something like that. But it'd be, I think, more useful in terms of where is the business going to go to think about, well, how are they actually going to solve the problem? And what are the hurdles about solving the problem? And then if it makes sense to use a particular technique, that's great. But it might that oh you know there's this other technique that we hadn't thought about or we need to invent something new how do we work on that so I always I always start from I guess I think it's the front but other people might say it's the back which is what is what is the problem exactly that we're trying to solve and learn as much as I can about it and I you know I've been very fortunate my my PhD is in system science so I think very broadly I, I can look at pretty much anything and say okay well, what's the input what's the output what's going on in the box between the two how does it have to relate to a person or a group of people, what, what learning things does it have to do, and try to abstract it, and then I can try to make a connection between any of the other things that I've worked on for over 30 years and figure out how to think about designing a system, whether it's trading for the stock market or, like I said, you know, detecting breast cancer. They sound like very different things, and in many ways they are different things. One's a static image, one's a dynamic system with people who are gaming against you, maybe, to try to defeat you. Uh, you might do something in a in a military situation where that's also true, but there might be other people who are trying to work with you. Not everybody's an enemy. You know, so it gets to be very complicated. But I, I always try to think about what are the problem states first and then go to the toolbox of algorithms second rather than start with the algorithms. Sure. No, you have, like you just said, that you have a very broad, you like to take the broad understanding or broad view about, you know, each problem. So when we look at today's problems, what kind of system do you think will be necess is necessary or will be necessary for the current challenges we are facing in, you know, irrespective of industries, like from security monitoring to climate changes or, you know, disaster prediction or, you know, terrorism, any system that we are trying to, you know, create broadly, if you look at it, you know, broadly, what kind of system you would, you know, envision that is necessary for us to, you know, be able to uh, have some intelligent, uh, you know, understanding or have some intelligent data coming to us. So I think you, you've, you've um, touched on, see, this is another effect check thing. I could have said hit on, but hit is aggressive and I don't want to say hit. So we'll say touched, <laughs> touch is more empathy. So I think you've touched on some things there that are uh, very intertwined, actually. So let me come back and <clears throat> recast a few of the things that I've said about uh, in the context of what your question is. When we think about how we're going to advance 
um, AI systems broadly, right? I think each of the techniques that we've talked about, whether it's a neural learning or fuzzy system swarm things, whether it's modeling how uh, bees find food, as a there's a bee colony algorithm that's uh, popular these days as well. There's ant colony optimization, all these different sets of tools to solve problems. Ultimately, they still have to come back and, and do what you said, which is intelligence augmentation. I'm not sure that you said that exactly, but I think that's that's what I interpreted you saying. I mean, it has to help us understand things, right? Otherwise, we're just gonna we're gonna go to the beach and let the AI take care of everything, which I don't think we're gonna do. So <clears throat> we have to we have to understand it. So I think right now, whereas before, the missing ingredients have always been between what's the theory of the machine learning and what's the actual practice of machine learning. People can do all sorts of practical things for which there's no theory and sometimes there's a theory which is very broad and doesn't help us with practice that's, that's often the case I think the missing ingredient actually going forward is going to be how do we have interpretable artificial intelligence systems to again give us a degree of confidence that we understand what they're doing and not just trust what they're doing especially when it becomes uh, life and death or very uh, important Decisions could be cybersecurity is very important too. It might not be life or death, but I guess it could be. It depends on what you're hacking. So again, we want to think a little bit about if you have, let's say, a very large neural network, and you have to try to explain it to somebody. It's very challenging. So there's there's ways to try to get about data mining. Uh, I've done that a little bit with simpler neural nets, and I've already found it to be complicated, right? So for example, I'll back up for a second. Uh, you may know that uh, in the late 1990s and the early 2000s, I worked with one of my colleagues, Marcella Pilla, on evolving a neural network for learning how to play checkers. And in that work, we started with, with randomly hooked up neural networks. And they were deep learning networks for the time. There were five five layers, so they weren't just a single hidden layer. They had five layers. And it was a convolution network where we were looking at different parts of the board. Uh, back then, that was also pretty brand new. I think we were calling it a spatial neural network. But really, today, it would be called a convolutional neural network. And over 840 generations of running on a Windows NT machine that was running basically a 450 megahertz processor, pretty slow, but that's what we had. We didn't have any funding for this. We just did it because we wanted to. Um, it was able to evolve a neural network that we could then hand play against people on MicrosoftZone.com, and it came up in the top 0.5% of all the people there, and then also play against a, a lesser version of uh, Chinook, which, of course, is the, the world's greatest checkers player and, and a perfect player at this point. Um, and have some wins at that lesser level and also have losses at that level. Point being that when we're going through all that process of, of doing that evolution and learning, you think, well, that's very broad. We can start with things that are just primitives and just say, well, where are the pieces? And what are the pieces and how do they move, right? And then have the system learn by adversarial gaming, which is a big thing right now. Um, how can we solve a problem without really knowing how to solve a problem? But then when we get back to, well, what is that neural network actually doing? I mean, I played a lot of games with that network. I played 165 games by hand against other people to figure out how good it was against other people. And I can tell you that I think it has an idea of uh, the concept of mobility. I think it has the idea that giving the opponent fewer options to move is better than having the opponent have lots of options to move. I don't even know at this point if that's what checkers players would really think is important, and I'm not 100% sure, having done it for all this time, that um, that I'm right. And I can I can tell you for sure that I know it's not it's not in neuron number five that it says mobility is important, right? Because a lot of it's really more distributed across a network of things. I have seen some things more recently where people have seen that they have correlations between a particular node in a net and a particular behavior that might have come up serendipitously. And I guess the, the question is, is it really serendipitous or is it spurious? And I guess we have to repeat the experiment to know. But again, if we can find tools, I think this is gonna be the next step to get back to the answer to your question. The next step is gonna be, how do we get uh, intelligible, even like in language, explanations of what an AI system is doing what is the stock market algorithm actually doing? It's a big neural net. It's a fuzzy system controller. What is it actually doing such that a trader is going to say, okay, I understand that. It makes sense. Let's go put $100 million on that trade today. What are we going to do with a, a doctor who's looking at a telemedicine system that's screening a patient who might be, let's say, in Africa that they don't have adequate health care, but we can do something with an AI system in telemedicine, and it comes back, and someone's going to make a decision. Does this person need to get to a major city very quickly and have the surgery or not? Well, you know, it could just be red light, green light, but I don't, I don't think that 
uh, people are going to be that accepting of those kind of systems. And so the real next step to me is how do we get those systems to relate to us in a way that uh, we feel comfortable. Yes, absolutely. And like you said, you know, these, these, these are all the steps that we need to take. But at this point, uh, is it fair to say that we have only increased the processing capabilities uh, that have made it possible to design machines that can rapidly compute and make implications from inputs? That's where we are, or have we achieved more than that? No, I think we've achieved more than that, but we've achieved that, which is important, right? And every time we have a hardware advancement, or a design of hardware advancement, it goes along with a software advancement, like an algorithmic advancement. So if, if we think back to trying to do a deep learning neural net on a Commodore 64 from 1985, I would have been stuck, right? Because I would have been waiting a very long time. Even with my, my checkers experiments, it took us six months to, literally six months, right? We hit the, the return key in January and got the answer in June. So as algorithm, as the hardware becomes more, um, facilitative of a particular approach, then we can think about, well, how do we design algorithms for that particular hardware that maximizes the benefit of that hardware? For example, let's say parallelism, right? Um, I can remember when the connection machine first came out, that was a hugely big thing. We went from a lot of focus of serial computing algorithms to all of a sudden, well, parallel computing algorithms, what can we do with that? And maybe we can get 50 Sun Spark stations put together in a network or 128 of them that some people were doing and solve problems 128 times almost faster than we would do if we had one problem, one computer that was working on it for the same period of time. So it's really, again, a marriage between the software and the hardware, as it always has been with wetware and hardware. You know, software and hardware goes the same way. You can't really advance one without thinking about what the advancements of the other are. When we think about, like, um, algorithms that are used in, uh, in chess or Go or whatever, it's always been how do we manage the tree search? How do we manage branching? How do we manage uh, evaluating uh, a sufficient subset of samples to know that we have a decent chance that we're going in the right direction? All those things are based upon now, based upon what the hardware restrictions are, or I guess I, I shouldn't say restrictions, what it facilitates, right, as opposed to what it prevents, what it facilitates in our algorithm designed to take advantage of that. If you're working, if you're working with a calculator, you might say, "Well, you know, I'll, I'm going to try linear regression because I know I can do an inverse transform matrix, and I'll I'll get an answer that's computable." Once you get past, like, "Well, you know what? I can do that, but I can do a whole lot more things too," then it becomes very attractive to do all those more things too. I just want to come back to reemphasize that sometimes it's helpful to say, "Well, let's take a linear part out first, and then see what we have left over using the tools that have been around for 200 years, maybe longer." Uh, and supposed to just, well, what's the latest, greatest novel thing? And let's use that because it's latest and greatest and novel. Where do you see the end point for computational intelligence? Where, what, what is the long-term vision? Is it the singularity or uh, are we you know, striving for something, uh, something else? I guess everybody has their own end point. I don't, I don't or maybe for me, I'm going to say I don't really have one because I don't think there's really a limit to what intelligence is. Uh, our understanding that it's going to change as we become more intelligent and that's going to open up a whole new set of problems and challenges for us. So I wouldn't want to be um, limiting, let's say, well, we got there, we're done. Now what do we do? You know, there's always going to be something else to think about doing. Um, but I do think that we're still, I think we're still far away from having I mean, commander data. Uh, I don't think that singularity is around the corner. And I appreciate those who think it's much closer than, than I do. I appreciate your argument. I guess it's all sort of an intuition at this point. But I have worked on problems long enough to have my own intuition biased by the challenge of what it is and, and trying to get all that hardware and software uh, together at the same time to solve our problems in that way in a very broad and general way is a, it seems to me like a very, very difficult problem. So. So those are the only challenges you see, or you see much broader challenges for computational intelligence to achieve the long-term vision? Well, I guess, Jason, let me ask, you know, in terms of long-term vision, I, I, I find that I, the long-term vision of things is made up by a lot of successes at the short-term vision. That's for me, right? So when, I've started, when I started working on evolutionary algorithms, I followed what my dad had written about in his book, Artificial Intelligence. Uh, through simulated evolution, which he published in 1966, right? So it's a long time ago and very visionary. And a lot of the early pioneers in evolutionary algorithms and neural nets and fuzzy systems 
had very broad visions about what might happen, but then the machines weren't able to catch up with their ideas, so they focused on, well, okay, how do we make a truck back up appropriately? That's a tough control problem. How do we balance a broomstick on a cart? That's maybe not so hard. How do we balance two broomsticks on a cart? That's harder, right? How do we balance a hen's broom on a cart? Okay, that's harder again. So it's, it's again, gets back to where can we make an advance that matters to someone versus how can we go straight to the end goal? And if the end goal is that we want to build human-like intelligence and robots, that's fine. But I don't think that we're going to get there by trying to do that. I think we're going to get there by solving a lot of other little problems along the way, like stock market trading and medical devices and drug discovery and thinking about problem solving generally and then getting the emotional part in there, as I mentioned before. So I think all these things are like pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. And instead of just saying, well, let's make the puzzle, I don't know, what, what does the puzzle even look like? Uh, how, do, how do the pieces go together? We have to kind of see, well, we have these pieces over here, they work together. And once you get those things together, it kind of opens up a whole new uh, area of a puzzle that you didn't even know that you had to solve in order to fit the whole thing. So it's, uh, I wish I had a more definitive answer for you, because it would be nice. But I think it, I have to give you an open-ended answer to an open-ended question. Yes, now there are so many complex variables involved here. The computational intelligence is dependent not just on what computer scientists or, you know, statisticians or, you know, all these experts are trying to create. They are trying to understand that from the human brain, what are the advances happening in the human brain mapping? And they're trying to uh, base their some of that understanding to advance the computational intelligence. And it's it's so complex. I mean, uh, in this risk round of dialogue, we won't be able to address all those different uh, variables because uh, it will take probably hours and hours. And we just don't have that much time to uh, cover all those topics. So we are going to, you know, this is the first uh, uh, round up in uh, the series of the computational intelligence. We will invite many, many guests uh, uh, who are experts in uh, their respective fields so that we can have a good comprehensive understanding. But uh, do you see that, you know, because there is a need for uh, collective intelligence, it is not the advances in computational intelligence are not going to come from just one, uh, you know, sector or one uh, expertise. It's going to depend on the so many advances happening across the sectors. And uh, I see a need for collective, you know, collaborative work efforts so that we can uh, have the advances or we can achieve our vision that we are trying to achieve in a much more, you know, uh, smarter way and much faster way. Do you see that the everybody is working in silo, like neuroscientists are working in silo, uh, computer, uh, computer scientists are working in silo. Do you see that there is a need for collaborative effort between them? I think there's, even in large companies, people are working in silos within large companies, right? I mean, the yes. silos are, are all over the place. So part, part of that is uh, the language that we use, right? So as a systems person, I've had the opportunity to do biology, I've had the property to medicine, and talk to people in various industries, food safety, things like that. They each have their own vernacular. And unless you have a specific reason for trying to understand what someone's talking about when they start talking in terms that you don't understand, it's just as easy to stop and go do the thing that you do know. So yes, I totally uh, agree that the collective intelligence part, both from the algorithmic side, which people have worked on, uh, I remember a very good talk by David Wolpert from Santa Fe Institute many years ago at the um, conference I was chairing, uh, I think it was 2002 even, um, on collective intelligence methods and there's been many advances since then, of course, in the last decade and a half. <clears throat> but how do you get algorithms to work together? It can be yeah, simple voting mechanisms have been tried, majority logic has been tried, and they all work to some degree on some problems and then they all fail in some problems too. There has to be times when maybe just one algorithm says, no, I, I know what I'm doing. You can be quiet. I'm going to take over now. And the other ones have to say, oh, okay, we'll do that, or they or not, right? So it gets to be just like human interaction. You get five people in a room, and they're all intelligent people who are knowledgeable in different ways about a problem, and you'll hear a lot of different things. I remember I was, at a, I was invited to go to a breast cancer symposium from the Army because we were funded by the Army for breast cancer research in the 1990s. And I was doing evolutionary neural networks for breast cancer detection, working with uh, Gene Watson, who was a medical doctor out at uh, Maui Memorial Hospital on Maui for this project. And so we attended and I presented on what we were doing 
And then uh, I think two speakers after me, somebody got up and started talking about wavelets. And wavelets were kind of a, a in the news thing. I can't say they were a new thing, but they were they were newly rediscovered, I guess. And the gentleman there started thinking about how wavelets were going to solve every problem, and they were the best thing ever. And if we weren't using wavelets, we were just all dumb. And I, okay, well, you know, we'll wait, we'll wait another year or two and see if that's true. And of course, it's not. It's not true. It's a tool like anything else. So I think part of the thing of what you're saying: how do we get intelligent systems to interact with each other appropriately? How do we get them to handshake? How do we get them to trust each other? How do we get to trust them? All those things are, are very open issues at this point, and and they're important. But I think you know, for the things that I focus on on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm more problem solving. What is the particular thing that we need to do? How do we need to help an AI system develop a better clinical trial? How do we need to have an AI system uh, help figure out what the price of a seat at a particular venue might be for someone so that they get the experience they want and the and the production company gets the value they want from their ticket? These are all you know what we would call basic engineering problems that one can use with AI. How do we find uh, patterns in the stock market when that's a dynamic pattern that's changing over time? The patterns don't stay the same. That's a challenging problem. So all, all those sorts of things are the things that I do. And, and my brother, Gary, who's got his PhD in biology and runs natural section with me, you know, focuses more on the biotech side, also uh, an arms race kind of problem, right, where we're talking about uh, how things change over time in nature and inside the body, inside a cell, how proteins change if you're trying to do, let's say, personalized medicine. What kind of tests can you do to say, no, the person should get this treatment rather than that treatment, and then generalize that across multiple people? Those are the, you'd say, well, those are kind of lower level problems, and they are. But until we have a good understanding of how those problems fit together, I think it's going to be more challenging to think about how we take all those pieces of the puzzle and then say, well, let's just build a, the end point, let's say, some human-like AI. It's, uh, Very true. It, it's, 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 it's difficult for me to see a direct yellow brick road that goes from here to there. Yes, very true. I mean, human brain is still the most complex computer that is there on the earth. So we yeah. st it will take a lot of effort for us to create a computer like that. So, uh, what would you like to tell our global viewers and listeners about your efforts at the natural selection and uh, any other, you know, uh, advice that would that you would like to give to a lot of, you know, uh, aspiring uh, uh, computer intelligence uh, scientists or, you know, people who are students who are trying to get into this broad AI sector? What would you like to tell them? Well, I think it's, it's, let's start in reverse. So I think students have a great opportunity now uh, to leverage all the gains that have been made by people in the last 30 years uh, to get to the point where AI is a really hot field. And it hasn't always been that way. There have been multiple AI winters where you go and you, know, you say you're doing artificial intelligence, that was not going to be a good thing that would be frowned upon. So there are several conferences that are available. Uh, you know, can go on the internet and find a bunch of them. I'll just mention ones that I, I'm involved in, which are typically with the IEEE Computational Intelligence Society which they could find online. I think it's IEEE-CIS.org. Uh, and then the conference that I'm chairing later on uh, this year, IEEE-SSCI.org, where you'll find a wide variety of different things that you can work on. One of the nice things about the conference that we're doing in November is for one registration price, you can attend all of the symposia as much as you want, and they're all running concurrently. So typically, you have to make a choice. Do I want to go to this conference in medicine? Do I want to go to this one in e-healthcare? Do I want to go to this one in cybersecurity? At this time, you don't have to make that choice. You just can go wherever you want, and you get the proceedings for everything. So you can find what resonates with you. The thing that I'd like to go back to and say, though, is instead of focusing on a particular technique, have a more broad uh, idea about what it is that problem solving is all about. Um, about 10 years ago or so, I wrote a book with uh, Smuchek Mikhailovich called How to Solve It, uh, Modern Heuristics. And rather than have it be, okay, chapter one is going to be about back propagation. And chapter two is going to be about fuzzy C means. And chapter three is, is so forth. We said, no, let's think about it from the problem's point of view and present it for how people could think about what tool sets they would want to use to address different problems, sort of the, the other way from which uh, you could teach material, right? Instead of like, okay, chapter one's all about this. All the questions are about this, and then when we go to chapter two, you can forget about this and go on to the next thing. Well, I, that's not really, for me, the way real-world problem solving works. So it, having a good review of the material that's in that book would be helpful. Uh, another book that I just published recently, <clears throat> which provides the fundamentals of computational intelligence broadly, I did with uh, two co-authors, Jim Keller and Daron Liu, 
and it's called Fundamentals of Computational Intelligence from my Triple E Press and John Wiley. And I think the thing that's unique about that that will help students get into the field is that each of us have been an editor-in-chief of one of the IEEE journals in this area. So Jim, for example, was the EIC for transactions on fuzzy systems, and Durong was the EIC for the transactions on neural networks, and I, of course, was the founding editor-in-chief of the evolution computation transactions. So we each wrote to our specific knowledge area and then went back to try to make it as close to one voice as we could across the whole material. And I think we've done a, a very good job in that in this particular uh, textbook. So there are a lot of introductory materials that are online, and I'd like to also recommend those things. I think you know for natural selection, we try to look on uh, helping different companies in various areas. So we're not focused on any particular area. I guess you could say we're focused on being unfocused. Right. So we we're there to, to help um, a variety of industries, whether it's professional sports or startup industries, uh, applications uh, for like an, an iPhone app that might re require uh, artificial intelligence. I mentioned uh, one in terms of color matching algorithms for people who are colorblind, for example, a color butler. And then you know other things that we do in the biotech area, which I'd have to let my brother talk about because we have some confidentiality things there. I wouldn't want to talk about something I shouldn't. He can do that better than I. So maybe you can have him on sometime to talk about some of the, the risks on the, on the biotech side. Um, but that's that. And then I think also, again, focusing back on things like a tech check, how can we have artificial intelligence systems look at the sentiment that we're conveying in our language so that ultimately that language can be hooked up to the other AI systems that we have and have that relate that information back to humans in a way that will be most uh, palatable. I think those are the things that I would like to focus on. Great. Thank you so much for sharing all that uh, information about all the resources uh, that are available. I'm sure our global viewers and listeners are going to benefit from that. And again, thank you, David, for participating in this roundup today. We appreciate your thoughtful insight on the science and applications of computational intelligence. And our global viewers and listeners would benefit tremendously from the information you provided on especially computational intelligence and its future. Even if a single individual or entity can come up with an idea to understand intelligence and innovate based on the understanding they received from the discussion we had today, this Risk Roundup Dialogue has been of service and we thank you for that. It's my pleasure. and People can contact me by email anytime. Happy to help. Wonderful, David. So as we make an effort to understand how we reason, how we memorize, how we learn, how we move, how our emotions work, as this fundamental ability is defined us as humans, the goal is to translate that understanding to build intelligent machines or intelligent systems. At this point, we hardly understand any of it. As we understand the science of intelligence further, fundamental changes are expected across nations with government industries, organizations, and academia, in short, referred to as NGIOA in cyberspace, geospace, and space, in short, referred to as CGS. However, it seems that much work still remains to be done. Risk Group Cybersecurity Risk Research Center and Strategic Security Risk Research Center are created for this very reason to identify, evaluate, and manage the risk facing NGIOA and CGS. We at Risk Group believe that risk management, security, and peace walk together hand in hand. Though security is related to management of threats and peace to the management of conflict, risk management is related to management of security vulnerabilities as well as management of conflict. And it is not possible to conceive any one of the three without the existence of the other two. All three concepts feed into each other. We believe that the security we build for ourselves is precarious and uncertain until it is secure for everyone across nations. Tradition becomes our security. So if you build a culture of managing risk effectively, it will lead us to security and security will lead us to peace. Let's manage the existing and emerging risk together for more information on the risk roundups. To watch the Risk Roundup videos or hear the Risk Roundup podcast, please go to riskgroupllc.com and do not forget to subscribe and share. Until next time, I'm Jayashree Pandya, host of Risk Roundup, signing off. See you next time. Thank you.